Now to our first subject of the day, the total value of capital importation into Nigeria in the second quarter of the year fell to $1.03 billion from $1.13 billion in the preceding quarter. That's according to the National Bureau of Statistics. This represents a 9% decline compared to the previous quarter. According to the MBS report titled Nigerian Capital Importation Quarter 2 2023, on year-on-year -year basis, the country's capital importation declined by 32.9% compared to the second quarter of 2022. In Q2 2023, total capital importation into Nigeria stood at $1.3 million, lower than $1.5 million dollars recorded in Q2 2022, indicating a decrease of 32.90%. Uh, in another development, petrol, petrol marketers have disapproved, disapproved of the monopoly in the supply of the product in their country, just as they confirmed that subsidy has crept in following the government's intervention. They said that the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NMPC Limited, should not be the sole importer of petrol into the country, considering the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act, PIA. A former chairman of the Major Oil Market Association of Nigeria, Tunji Uyebanji, said the NMPC's monopoly must be broken. President Bola Tinubu had on May 29 announced the removal of the petroleum subsidy, a development that led to the increase in the pump price of the product from 186 naira per liter to about 617 naira per liter. Joining me now to discuss these issues is Professor Olawale Ajayi, Professor of Legal, Social, and political environment of business and head of department of strategy at the Lagos Business School. Professor Ajay, good to have you on Arise News. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining me. Prof, let's start with this uh, capital importation statistics, now provided by the National Bureau of uh, Statistics, indicating that there has been a drop in terms of capital importation into Nigeria. Now, the MBS did not just say there has been a drop, nine point something percent. It goes further to say 28 states out of the 36 states have no record, complete zero, in terms of capital importation. What does it mean? Why is capital importation? Why is it important? You are the professor. Well, Can you enlighten us? Yes, thank you very much. You need capital to spur growth. Uh, typically, you need capital. You need to ensure that you have as many of your able-bodied uh, citizens in active employment in order to grow the economy. Um, so capital is, 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 is very important for growth. If you are not able to, to generate sufficient domestic savings, then the other place to get that capital would be from uh, overseas. Uh, but in the world in which we are, um, according to Michael Porter, nations compete on the basis of the ability to offer a friendly business environment that attracts investors into that environment. And when they come, they bring in technology, they generate production. And of course, part of that is, is also the, uh, the diffusion of technology into the host country. Um, so this is very important. Uh, China, for example, I think generates about 180 uh, billion uh, dollars. The United States is still the first with about 318 billion 
dollars. So even those who are already developed or doing well are still trying to uh, attract uh, as much investment as they can. Of course, borrowing, which is another way to, uh, to attract investment, comes with its finance, financing costs. But the uh, uh, foreign direct investment, particularly uh, usually uh, equity-based, uh, is, is cheaper. And it has all those other multiplier uh, benefits. Africa, as much as Nigeria, needs as much investable capital as uh, it can get. So this is, is, is uh, first important, to have a business environment that attracts uh, you know, importation of capital uh, for the growth of the economy. Well, Professor Ajay, I need you to help break this down for the benefit of our viewers and listeners who are not economists. Now, what we are told by the National Bureau of Statistics is that when you disaggregate it, the largest capital importation is from portfolio investments, about 57.32%. So why is it that uh, people who are interested in Nigeria, they are just interested in portfolio investments, they are not interested in other things? Well, why is our economy at that level? You know, portfolio investment is just like the name sounds. Bring in your suitcase, don't set up house so, so that when things go wrong, you can easily exit. And of course, it's been found that that has seemed to be the, the trend in terms of investing in Nigeria, investing in the stock exchange. And anytime things appear rough, you can easily just call your stock broker and the money disappears. Whilst that is useful to have portfolio investment, I think the more useful investment is those who are coming to establish uh, production in its factories, businesses here in Nigeria. You know, uh, investment that goes over a longer period and that is actually a friend or an ally of, uh, of growth and development. But as I, in my initial uh, uh, words in our introduction has made it plain that you must attract investment because investable capital, as they say, is agnostic. There is enough money, more than enough, but it's looking for a friendly environment, a stable environment, uh, in, in, in an environment where there is high productivity and in which returns are more or less uh, certain. And then you would find uh, the capital flowing in that direction. Okay, this conversation is based on statistics provided by government. Yes. The National Bureau of Statistics. Now, portfolio investment accounts for close to 60%. But we are told that uh, when you look in terms of FDI, that's almost like 6%. What is the difference? If you can just uh, explain to our viewers. Right, okay. Portfolio so, investment, very high. Foreign direct investment, very low. 6%, 6 point something percent. So let's, let's put it in, people come in, bring their money to buy shares on the stock exchange. And then you have people who come to establish farms, establish factories, you know, establish businesses, that the latter is foreign direct uh, investment. And that is where you can have those uh, farms employing people, buying supplies, and producing in order to, of course, export. And we can get benefits from, from that, from that type of uh, investment. That is what we really do need. If you look at China, for example, that is what has made China has become, you know, the the uh, the, the factory of the whole world. Nigeria is an excellent place for that. Just we have the primary raw materials. We even have with with uh, our petroleum, petrochemicals, chemical industry. If we had all of those developed. 
and with the, the, the labor rates, the Nigeria should be a prime place for long range manufacturing. Of course, our educational standards are not where they're supposed no, to be. Well, Professor Ajay, at this moment, what we have is that nobody wants to do long range investment in this environment. The statistics provided by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that people are just interested in short term investments. Why is that the case? How do we address that? They have to be. I can think of, and you, we can all see infrastructure. The, the, the stock of infrastructure, the quality of infrastructure is poor. Talk about the roads, talk about power, you know, talk about even the port facilities that we have that is with all the bottlenecks. You need all of this in order to ensure that you have, uh, what's it now, stable production. Talk about the cost of financing, you know. Talk about, in Nigeria, for example, easily, a cost disadvantage for manufacturing in Nigeria is in the order of 30 to 40 percent. In other words, if you establish a, a factory in Nigeria, if you are importing from anywhere, you're already like 30 or 40 percent at a disadvantage because of you know, these factors that I have I've mentioned. So typically what those of us in manufacturing did was to request government to give us tariff, at, tariff equality on the basis that you know we're disadvantaged because of country factors. So set tariff at 30 or 40 percent for imports so that we all can start at the same level. But the way it is now is that even shipping rates from China are cheaper than to ship goods from Lagos to Kano. In fact, uh, I won't be surprised if it won't be almost in the order of 500% uh, to 1,000%. You know, you also have all the bottlenecks of, uh, you know, diverted uh, uh, perverse incentives of some of our uh, operatives. And then policy instability. There's policy that says come and invest in this, in, in this area, and then before you know it, the next year, policy has changed, and you have invested. So these are some of the very clear uh, downsides to investing in Nigeria. Uh, th these are issues. OK, Prof. Let's look at the report again by the National Bureau of Statistics. It says, the countries that seem to be interested in Nigeria, the United States, Singapore, South Africa, and then somewhere in that report, China is also mentioned. Okay, what's the uh, attraction of Nigeria for businesses in uh, United States, Singapore, South Africa, and China? China, very to a large extent, uh, is doing a lot in terms of uh, investing in infrastructure. We do have also, very interesting enough, we have Chinese investment, and sometimes just from the Chinese private sector in manufacturing in Nigeria. For example, see how the Chinese have sort of helped raise the uh, furniture furniture uh, sector. Uh, we, you, the South Africans mainly ha came in in terms of merchandising, uh, but unfortunately we found them also rapidly departing. You can think of ShopRite uh, as a very recent example. Of course, South Africa would naturally try to ex exploit apparent catchment areas in Africa, but they seem to be rather uh, sensitive. Uh, the, the Americans typically invest uh, in the uh, petroleum, oil and, oil and gas industry. Uh, probably uh, you'd also have seen some investment in some areas uh, related to banking. Singapore, mostly uh, that would be around the agriculture areas. Uh, these, uh, you think of the oil lamps and so on and so forth. So I think that those are sectors in which uh, you see that type of activity in recent times, yes. 
Okay, in the statistics provided by the National Bureau of Statistics, Lagos seems to be what? Over 70%. Followed by FCT, about 20 something plus uh, percent. But you have uh, other states of the Federation, about 28 of them, attracting zero foreign importation at attention. Ikiti State, I think they managed to get maybe $5,000 or $15,000. Undo State, maybe $200,000. Uh, okay, what is responsible for this? And what lessons can we learn? Because the 28 states out of 36 almost projected as absolutely useless. And yet in these states, you will hear the governor say, we are taking a loan from this place, and uh, we are meeting investors. What is the purpose of all these investment drives that they talk about? They are just a taxpayer's expense going up and down. And yet, when we get the reports, uh, Undo State gets 200000 Ikiti State gets uh, like $2,000. No, what is the problem, really? I think part of the national problem also has to do with the issue of security. So that why the rates have come down, that's very important. I'll go into the these states. Then you also have you saw in the previous administration the issue of forex differential rates. Uh, that was a very major disincentive because you know you, you don't know you bring in money at one what one rate you don't know how much uh, at what rate you're going to No but you. my concern is how do we make these state, state units productive? For How this, do we yes. make them centers of attraction for investment? Yes. $200,000 uh, going to uh, Kiti, uh, Yondo State, $25,000 going to uh, uh, Kiti State in the uh, uh, second quarter of 2023. Uh, I'm sure the people who have stolen money in those states can, can dash the entire state $25,000 or $200,000. What is the problem? Well, let me start from the light. Why don't you say those who have stolen money should come and invest or should go back and invest in those states? Uh, you must invest, in, well, which is also a way of saying local investors must lead. And we have Nigerians who have funds abroad. They should bring those monies back. But m what is a problem is that many states in Nigeria do not recognize that they are, you know, they should see themselves as countries in, 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 in the sense that they need to provide a business environment that attracts businesses. On the contrary, you find a situation where one governor was fighting Dangote and things like that. When you have such uh, harsh policies, even for businesses that are in your environment, that is not being very astute. When you, uh, you house it now, you concentrate on you know, just uh, rudimentary activities. You are not growing the, uh, the uh, small, medium-scale enterprises. You, in other words, you don't have policies that allow entrepreneurs to, you know, to spring up and to grow and scale. You don't, then you, are, you, will, not, you will not attract. Uh, you, and you are concentrating on, on uh, what is it now, FAC allocation. What needs to happen is that those states should realize that they need to be inserted in regional value chains, in global value chains, by attracting industries, by ensuring that we have what Richard Joseph calls an enterprise society a society in which business enables the private sector and unleashes the, you know, invertebrate entrepreneurial capacities of Nigerians. But the same Richard yourself says Nigeria is a prebender society where people are perpetually looking for opportunities at the expense of others. But let me ask you about something else. In that report by the National Bureau of Statistics, there was a reference to Lagos doing well and Abuja FCT doing well. 
Lagos close to 70 something percent in terms of capital importation. Uh, SCT uh, getting uh, up to about 25 percent or more. What explains that uh, differential? Lagos in, uh, in alignment with the 28 states like Imo, like Kwara, like Kogi, like uh, all those other states that nobody paid attention to. They are just existing. Ogun State and some other states got some investment. Ikiti, uh, Undo, you know, Undo got $200,000. Ikiti got $25,000. What explains this discrepancy? Or are we dealing with a crisis with the failure of data? Because the N NBS is not, it's not very reliable, even when it comes to data. Well, I, I wouldn't want to agree with you or disagree with you, uh, but the point of the fact is that Lagos is, I think, probably the sixth largest economy in Africa. Lagos has tried to position itself in that regard. In other words, trying to drive competitiveness of Lagos. Every, in fact, even every city, every town, every local government should work to be competitive. In other words, to have a, 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 a business environment that grows local entrepreneurs and that attracts people to come. And they need not come from outside. If they can, they can come into your state. That has to be the way in which uh, our, our, our governments uh, operate. Uh, and get away from this issue of FAC allocation. There are comparative advantages in each state that can be turned to competitive advantages. You have to apply specialization to whatever comparative advantages you have. There's no point having so many people who are poorly educated. There's no point having growing the, the, the Nigeria is the biggest uh, housing now, producer of cassava. But if you keep just producing cassava to eat gari and so on, you won't get anywhere. You've got to ensure you have research institutes that are coming up with, you know, cassava that will have better yields. You have business, even local manufacturers who are able to turn that cassava into starch, into glucose, and so on and so on. And a state that produces a lot of cassava that sort of em empowers, you know, activity in that regard will easily find that its products are going beyond Nigeria and in foreign exchange. And government doesn't need to do it. What it needs to do is to attract those who can come and have the, 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 the peace of mind that they can be there long term for the gestation of the products. And of course, you know, you also have the logistics. That is where you have to al align with government, the federal government. And everybody is working in that direction. Nigeria is, is such a richly blessed nation. Okay, uh, Professor Ajayi, let me bring up another major issue now. In the last two days, many Nigerians in parts of the country observed poor queues. And the concern was, why do we have these first queues? Dealers, players, major players in that oil market uh, space said, well, President Tinubu removed four subsidy on May 29. Four subsidy is gone, but he is providing four subsidy, and that he didn't do his homework when he decided that uh, four subsidy is gone. The Nara has been uh, devalued, and in any case, uh, the pump price of uh, fuel internationally is going up and down, making it very difficult. Worst of all, they complain about an NMPC monopoly with the uh, importation of oil, and that in any case, all of these situations make things difficult for them because NMPC enjoys a monopoly, and the foreign exchange system is so chaotic. What do you think? It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting because I firmly am of that school that believes that the fuel subsidy must go in order for us to restructure the economy, have more productivity, have more efficiency. 
but there, there will be the pains. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of opaqueness, uh, opacity around the you know, numbers, economic numbers in the last administration. All those uh, reports about you know, performance, growth, uh, the foreign reserves, we now discover that uh, there's so much that is not correct there. Um, and I think the, there's need to, you know, come out with the truth so that we can clean the OGN stable. Uh, unfortunately, the, what's it now, the, 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 the price of, of, of crude is rising. And there's such a lot of speculation as far as the, you know, the Naira is concerned. <clears throat> People are rather putting their money in dollars as a hedge. These are sort of not normal okay, economic Professor, behavior. Yeah, could it be that the problem we're dealing with is that the president did not understand the situation before he came on television on inauguration day today to say, first subsidy is gone. Could they have approached it differently, in your opinion? I, I wouldn't want to second guess the president because in, uh, in previous t occasions when effort has been made to remove it, the pushback has been so fierce that that has been difficult. I don't think that you would have had a situation where you say, we are going to remove fuel subsidy in 30 days. It will still, because people will then start speculating. Either you're going to have that, uh, what's it now? It's natural economic behavior. So I'm not sure that there would, there is any, there would, was really any easy way to go about it. In any event, there was no budget between, was it now, from June downwards. So I think uh, that is, 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 a, is a point. If, you know, when economists look at the dollar, at the Naira, the true value of the Naira ought to be around 730, $1 to 730 Naira, 730, 740 Naira, you know, using all the indices. So there's a lot of betting on the Naira, a lot of speculation, a lot, and, and you need confidence to be able to address all these issues. Okay, Professor Ajay, what is the way forward? Shouldn't the president just be honest? He told us May 29 that first subsidy is gone. Shouldn't he be honest and just come forward and say first subsidy is back? Because the various marketers, other players are saying first subsidy is in fact back. Shouldn't we ask for transparency and accountability in this regard? And shouldn't the president just come and say, well, I'm sorry. I said first subsidy is gone, but it is back. You know, even Kenya, that removed subsidy, introduced subsidy. In Europe, in previous times, when, when you know, fuel prices go high, there's always a push to remove those taxes in order to bring the prices down. And in the United States, whenever fuel price goes up, the presidents work extra hard to try and make sure it goes down. I think President Tunubu at a point said, if the issue, if the issue is tough, if the, tough, if the uh, tough situation continues, he will do something about it. So implicitly, what he said is that if the suffering will be too much, he will apply a peg. I don't think people need to now be pillorying him for that. I think it's, no, it's no, even... No, 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 the suffering is already too much. Yes. I'm asking you, as a subject area expert, what should you do? Should you just come and be honest and tell us this uh, subsidy is gone, it's not working. We are reintroducing subsidy and this is what we should do. Because when this happened, you know, fuel price jumped from uh, 186 per liter to over 500. Now we have been told that, in fact, the realistic range will be about over 700 naira per liter. Who is going to pay that uh, over 700 naira per liter when we have already been buffeted from all angles? So, what is the honest opinion you will give him? Shouldn't he just come and say, well, 
as the government of the people that wants to restore hope. Because if we can't get fuel, if we are paying at uh, almost 800 naira per liter, we will be hopeless. Just as the economists, just give me an idea. What well, is it that I can do? I'm, well, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I think what... You are not an economist. I think what, <laughs> what he should, what any government should do is he should maintain an open and transparent communication with the people. If you want to do reforms, you've got to be able to explain to them and elicit their willing participation in going along with those reforms. And you also need to signal by what you do to, uh, to you need to set an example so that people can see that uh, you are going in a party. You must be clear about your strategy. So I don't want, uh, it, it, there should be no prevarication. You should be clear on your strategy and try to, to muster the political and social capital to go in that direction. If we're able to deal, for example, with public transportation, then whoever wants to buy petrol, let them buy petrol at whatever rates. You can, if you're able to ensure that haulage or logistics, you can do something about ensuring the prices are not uh, out of range, you're able to put in public transportation so that anyone can, go, you can subsidize that. So that's a targeted subsidy. It is the untargeted nature of fuel subsidy that is senseless. We don't need that. Okay, Professor Ajay, let me rephrase the question. The Petroleum Industry Act was very clear that going forward, the regime for petroleum subsidy will be subject to market, market forces. Correct. Okay. Are you a market forces uh, supporter, or you think that if they continue to insist on market forces, at the end of the day, all of us will be perhaps dead? I think uh, th what I said last is very clear. You can apply targeted subsidies, but other than that, let us see how we can build effective markets. I, that, that would be, the, I think, the way forward, because if we are not going in the direction of reforms, we may leave it too late that the country will tip, you know, the other side. Well, on that note, Professor Adewale Ajayi of the Lagos Business School, I would like to thank you very much for joining us on This Alive, the Sunday talk show.